Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Luminosity of Free Software. This is episode 19, which makes the next one even more exciting because it will be 20. This is just the measly meager 19. Hello to everybody who's in the IRC channel um, and online as well, watching live. And if you're catching it later on YouTube, hello to you as well. Uh, for those in the IRC channel, if you have questions and comments, as usual, uh, feel free to pepper them over there. I've got you on this side of my screen so I can watch what happens as it goes. Um, if there's any issues with uh, audio or whatnot as we go, although everything looks good on my screen here, um, just let me know as well in the IRC channel as we go. So today's topics um, are twofold. And I promise to keep this week's episode well under an hour because there's an important hockey game coming up in a bit. Um, so I've got my tea as usual ready to go, although it's not the, the Tux Cup this week, it's the Pistachio Frenchman Cup, I have no idea. But it's got tea, which is good. So this um, week we're looking at two different topics. One is uh, a, a viewer submitted question actually two weeks ago, and I said last week I would get to it in the QA section. And I failed because there was so much great discussion happening um, around the topics uh, last week that I didn't actually get to additional questions outside of those two topics last week. So I decided instead to turn into a full segment this week, and that is uh, you know, what would be a great or a useful, good, however you want to phrase it, um, first programming language for someone who's getting back into development. It was submitted by Tom Arnold, who asked, you know, who said, you know, he's been away from programming for a while, he's getting back into it, and he's looking at a couple of different options, one being uh, Go, and, and the other being QML. And he asked, you know, what did I think about these? Were they good options? Were they were there better concepts out there? Um, where does it all stand? Uh, and it got me thinking, and since I turned into a full segment, I also wanted to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart and related to this, and that is what should people who are not just coming back to programming for, for you know, kind of getting their feet wet again, but people who are new to programming for the very first time, um, young people, uh, as well as uh, older students, first timers, and whatnot. So I will start with with Tom's original question, which was, "I'm coming back to programming. Uh, are you know things like QML and Go a good option?" So um, I'm sure you know since it's a topic of you know what are good programming languages. This is a bit like asking, "What is my favorite flavor of ice cream?" There is no way to do this without it being. Someone out there on the internet will wildly agree with everything I say, and, us, and a bunch of other people will violently disagree. So, but that's the best thing about having your own, you know, webcast is you get to share your opinions. Um, at least I like to think my opinions are, are based on some level of experience and a fair amount of thought put into it. So, all that aside, um, what do I think about Go and QML? And I'll take them separately. So QML, for those who don't know, is a declarative um, UI system. I kind of hesitate to, to call it a language, per se. Um, it, at the heart of it, there's JavaScript. Um, and you write all the little snippets of actual uh, procedural code you write is JavaScript. And the QML itself also looks very JavaScripty. Now, it's a part of the Qt, or depending on which part of the world you're from, the Qt uh, library, or the Qt frameworks. Um, and it's really designed specifically for doing user interfaces. It's not the kind of thing you're going to write a web server in. Uh, it's specifically for GUIs. But that said, it does it really, really well. And I think it embodies what is the future of UI development, and that is um, declarative UI. And we, for a long time, have done, you know, procedural in procedural languages um, or structural languages uh, like C and C++ or Python and whatnot. We've done user interfaces, and generally, the way that you do them there is you define, you know, here's I'm going to make a new button, and I'm going to add it to a layout over here, and I'm going to connect that button to this function over here. So when that button, you know, gets clicked, then run this this function runs, and maybe it updates the button, and maybe it does something else. And oh, when this button over here is clicked, I need this part of the UI to do something differently. So in the function is connected there, then I'm going to write some code that modifies this over here. This works, you know, relatively well. 
uh, for the kinds of user interfaces that we were developing in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, there have been some changes in what we expect from a user interface these days. Uh, one is we expect the user interfaces to be a lot more dynamic. We expect things like animations. We want them to look pretty. Uh, and we also don't want to spend as much time writing them as we used to. So it turns out that dynamic UIs are really, really hard to do uh, in you know, the normal languages that we have to do them with. When you actually have a human sitting there and kind of gluing all the pipes together, it's pretty hard. And QML gets rid of all of that. It's declarative. So what you do in QML is you basically declare um, what the UI looks like structurally. And then you say, instead of connecting, you know, when this button is clicked, then, you know, call this function, you can do that in QML as well. Uh, what you generally do is you say, I would like when this button's event fires, I would like this other thing to occur. Um, so, and I'd like the text on the button to be the value of this other part of the user interface. So if the text that's shown is dynamic, you don't actually have a function usually that you know, assigns the text directly. Instead, you say that you bind the text property of the button to the result of some other part of the UI. And so you spend a lot less time writing little bits of glue code that runs around and, you know, when this happens and change that. Um, and instead, you get a, a very clean description of what your application does and looks like. Um, and the result is vastly less code, a lot fewer bugs, and things tend to run a lot smoother. The other nice thing about it is that it um, presents the UI in a way that is uh, able to be modeled before anything is run. And this allows the, uh, the rendering of it to be done extremely efficiently because it can actually tell <clears throat> exactly when, what part of the UI is going to be changing and how, uh, which with imperative um, approaches to UI uh, design, it's really, really hard for the renderer to know what's coming next. And so what they tend to do is provide a lot of very highly optimized code paths and recommended ways of doing things, whereas with the declarative UI, you can actually create a scene graph in memory and then render that graph um, quite efficiently, uh, including taking advantage of, of the uh, facilities on the GPU. So you have a select set of optimized paths. You have a generalized uh, rendering approach. QML as a language is relatively mature at this point. Um, we've, I've personally worked with it right from the very beginning, um, before it was even overly public, um, and it's a lot more mature than it was. There's still stuff left to be done. Um, there are things I'm, I'm not overly happy with it still. Um, they haven't solved some of the issues around packaging yet. So if you're used to the really nice like Ruby gems, or Node.js packages, or with Go, which we'll talk about in a second, their packaging, it doesn't have that. But for UIs, it is absolutely fantastic. And it allows you to go from really, really simple stuff, so if you're just getting back into things, um, you can do really simple things. Uh, but you can then ramp it up to whatever you, whatever kind of lengths you want to go to. If you want to really get into things and start extending the, the core capabilities, you can write some C++ using Qt, which is fairly pleasant. Um, and extend what QML is capable of. You can also, right within the QML, um, write OpenGL shaders. So if you want to play around with OpenGL and how does that work, um, at least with QML2, I'm thinking of Qt5 here and, and QML2, uh, you can put QML, or, or sorry, OpenGL uh, code directly into your QML and play with it that way. So you don't have to you know, start running, you know, writing C or C++ to get playing with OpenGL. You can get straight to it with QML. That said, it's not a general programming language. I mentioned before, you're not going to write a web server in it or this kind of thing. For you guys, it's, it's really fantastic. I really think it's probably the best thing that's going out there. Ah, one other really important thing about it is that it now can be deployed on iOS, on Android, on plain Linux, on Windows, on Mac. The cross-platform uh, support is out of this world. It's just fantastic and phenomenal. So if you want to do, you know, start to dabble in um, mobile development, but maybe you don't want to completely engross yourself in either the closed silo of iOS or the slightly less closed silo of Android, 
um, and learn, you know, Objective C, Java. Um, QML gives you a way to get onto those platforms, um, but also use your application directly on your, you know, your Linux laptop, or I guess if you have to run it on for your operating system, those as well. So the cross-platform store is really cool, and there's really nothing else out there that has that kind of uh, cross-platform story um, in combination, especially with the kind of performance and capabilities. So the other the other uh, language he mentioned was Go, and <clears throat> yeah. So I will come out and say it. I'm not a huge fan of Go. I think that for the problem space it was designed for, it's probably a large step up from what the people who you know des who was designed for were using. Um, now Go is a is a language. It is a general purpose language. It's um, developed by and it's created by Google. Um, I think that there's a, a vested interest that Google has in making sure it's popular and well publicized because they want to hire engineers that know how to use it. Um, but that said, it is there's you know free software implementation of it, um, and it's a general purpose language. It is designed to be a systems language, which means that it's supposed to be you know not purposefully easy to use in the same way that say Python is. Um, but I, so I, I struggle with it, and maybe it's my my you know I'm an oldie, uh, but I'm also kind of spoiled by some of the newer languages. Um, the things I don't like about Go tend to go along the lines of um, the interface system is interesting. Um, instead of doing inheritance, they have interfaces. In small projects, I'm sure this works wonderfully. Um, but because it's is simply a you just implement methods uh, or functions of the right name, and if the interface happens to say I need functions of that name, then it works. That means you have to really be careful with the naming of your functions and your interfaces. Um, and if you control the whole the whole scope of the project, great. I can't imagine that how well that works just if you glue random stuff together. Um, some of the other parts of the language, the way that you know types are handled, not my favorite. Um, the syntax, well, whatever, you get used to whatever syntax is thrown at you. Um, the other issue I have with it is you can tell it's, uh, you know, written, well, one of the designers is Ken Thompson of CPay, and you can really see that it's heavily influenced by C, which makes it a really strange kind of combination of, uh, it's kind of high level, but it's not really high level, and it looks a hell of a lot like C. So it has a lot of the Unix systems that we come you know, love in C, um, but it retains a lot of that really crusty um, interface and API. So, you know, it has a package, a standard package called FMT font, as I believe it's actually call, or referred to, not format. So you have FMT. It's like, yeah, because what, we don't have text editors that autocomplete anymore, and so we have to have everything three letters long. Um, and it still has things like, you know, printf and, and whatnot, which if you're trying to preserve the knowledge of C developers, great idea. If you're trying to create a language that's you know going to take us into the next, you know, into the future, horrible idea in my opinion. Um, these are the naming of, of functions should never be a new language should never be modeled after C in, in my humble opinion. They're relics of an of an older time, um, and so yeah. Now, Go does have some great things about it. Uh, it has built in, you know, fetch me this package automatically, so I've got the whole packaging thing figured out, as do pretty much all the newer languages like Ruby and whatnot. Um, so that's really good. Uh, they have built in um, mechanisms for concurrency and this kind of thing. It's really designed for, you can see that it's designed by, by Google because it's all about accessing things on the web doing, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, take this set of, of uh, objects and then, or, or this set of data and shard it up, um, process it in chunks in, in parallel and then bring it all back together, reduce the results back. And it makes these things very, very simple. Um, so there's all these built-ins that are actually pretty, pretty damn nice. Um, I think you could do a lot worse um, for a language coming, you know, back into development. That said, it's not the most popular language out there. I don't think you should pick things based purely on popularity. 
but it really helps me getting back into things because it makes it easier to find other people who know what is going on, how to use it, um, and you'll find a lot more resources, um, support libraries, and whatnot. Uh, in fact, in the I looked up tonight just to see exactly what the popularity was, and it when it debuted, it shot really quickly up to number thirteen um, on one of the, um, the industry watch lists for you know popular in terms of usage and jobs and all these other things. Um, and since then, it's just steadily declined. It's now at thirty-five on the same list, which isn't bad at all. Um, but decline is you know it's not even remotely you know treading water. So as a language to play around with and see and you know try out the new concepts and ideas, I think it's a fine idea. Not right for my time. Um, if I was to you know, try and wrap my head around the ideas of Go, I'd probably jump straight into a functional language, which we'll talk about in a minute. So from there, I, I you know really started thinking about, well, what about teaching people? What's a great first language to teach people who want to learn how to write software? And there's I kind of divide this, uh, divide this up into two groups. One is the um, interested in, but it's not going to be a serious occupation of mine, and the other group that's you know more serious about it. I'm not talking about computer science people strictly uh, when I talk about serious. Now, obviously, they fall into the serious category, but uh, you know it's also the people that go to you know the, the two or three year technical schools to learn how to program. Usually, spits out Java developers, right? Um, in the old days, Visual Basic <laughs> developers. So, uh, but also people that you know have more than a passing interest and would like to learn how to do it as a hobby or whatnot. So people who are actually learning. So of those two groups, I think there's a split um, in in how to approach it. Um, so there's the the casual um, people, and I would lump younger people into this as well. You know, kids that are six, seven, eight, nine years old and above. And you go, what? We wait. You're going to teach these kids how to program. Um, I think that programming has a couple of really important things. Number one, computers are everywhere and they're only becoming more prevalent, not less. Um, being able to write basic code gives you an idea of how these systems work, which is always nice to know how your tools kind of work, but it's a great tool for teaching how to solve problems, how to look at a problem, break it down, and solve it. And then we used to throw, we still throw this, in math classes in the form of word problems. Which most people, in my experience, tend to hate. I love them, but I like riddles and the like. Um, I loved them in school. Most kids just oh, hated them, and I can completely understand it. But the idea was, you take a language-based problem, you translate it into math, and then you figure it out, which is boring as hell um, for most people. And programming is exactly that. You take a description of a problem, you break it down into some sort of mathematical algorithm to to solve it, and then you do it. Mm, yes, you have a machine doing the actual math for you. I think it's a really fundamental um, kind of thing to teach young people how to do. And it's a lot more fun than word problems. So I'd love to see programming taught to many, many, many more people than it is today. I'd love to see it become a standard part of the curriculum um, you know, in, in middle elementary school, you know, age 10 and up. I think every kid should take um, or at least be exposed to it, for the same reason that we force them to do word problems. I would actually say skip word problems, kill them, remove from the math textbooks, uh, forget that, and uh, replace it with with the programming books. Um, but I'm not a, a teacher, so what do I know? That said, um, I think that for young people, teaching them, you know, for loops and while loops and if else, control flow and variables, this is pretty boring and dry. Um, and there's a couple of, I think, ways to get past the dryness of it. Mm, first of all, teaching syntax is something that kids, I think, pick up um, along the way. And I say that based on watching kids learn how to program. Um, and so you don't really have to start as you normally do in, say, a university course or in some of the technical training courses I've, I've seen. Um, where you start with what, you know, what's a variable, how do you do control flow, blah, blah, blah. Instead, I think there's a couple things that can be done. One is practical or almost um, uh, incidental programming. So m my son, who's now 13, 
almost four, turning 14 in a couple of weeks, if you can imagine. Um, he picked it up as he went by, of all things, scripting games. He loves playing games, and he found out that a lot of them have control consoles that you can pull up. And these control consoles are controlled by this you know, scripting language thing. Um, and so he picked it up as he went doing that. That, I think, is a great way to introduce kids to it. And you can you know, make it more formal and say, we're going to learn Lua, and then we're going to learn how to script these, this, gaming, um, uh, or this, this game or that game. And the cool thing about it is it, it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's entertaining, but they're actually solving real-world problems. There's even an entire um, role-playing game construction kits where you kind of point and click you know, maps and, and create things, but then everything inside the game is controlled with little scripts that you write. And you end up learning control flow, and you end up learning about variables and these other things. And you, know, you don't need to understand you know, how to structure a program and do you know, system design and these kind of things. The other thing that I would love to see happen more is don't put kids in front of the desktop or the laptop that they know and, and see all the time. This is, when I was a kid, that was exciting. I sat down in front of, you know, a Pets computer or an Apple computer, um, and if we're lucky we got the new Apple IIEs, and, and this was exciting because these were new things that, you know, were science fiction -y. These days, they all know them. What's really cool, though, is if you can give them their own computer to destroy or, or hopefully build something with. And I'm thinking of the kind of you know small hardware devices, things like the Raspberry Pi or Make Linux Improv, which is a nice little platform that has more than enough computing power, especially the Improv, to do almost anything you really want to do in these kinds of things. But it gives them a cool little computer they can hold in their hands and go, wow, this is this is new. This is something I haven't seen before. Um, they're not so expensive that you have to you know make sure everything is completely safe. They can go crazy on them in terms of what they try and do. If they break it, you reflash it. It's no big deal. Um, you can have spares around to hand out in case one goes, you know, you have to reflash it with the OS later. Um, I think it's a lot more hands-on and interesting. They can actually hook up wires and, you know, teach them about you know, GPIO so you get to that point. Um, and, but it's something they can actually hold in their hand and go, wow, this is neat, this is cool. Um, and it gets them out of that, you know, oh, we you know, have Windows on the or Macs or whatever in this school, and this opens their eyes and gives them a, you know, a real touch and feel for what a computer is, what's inside the guts of that smartphone or tablet or laptop that you use. So that's for the young and casual people, um, and I would also recommend going for something that's, you know, very hand-holdy and easy to get into. Something like Python, I think, is absolutely perfect for introducing programming to young people you know, casual, in a casual development environment. That said, I think it's completely the wrong way to approach serious, uh, the, the topic of I want to learn how to develop seriously. This is something I want to take on and, and go further with in my life. I don't want to just use programming as a way to explore problem solving or to understand how you know, the plethora of computers around me kind of work. I want to actually learn how to write software. So. What is a great first language for that? And I'm sure that if you're watching this and you're a programmer, you're thinking of your favorite you know, high-level language, and I think that that is completely the wrong way to go about it. Um, instead, I think that the, the best approach for serious first developers is picking up a machine language, assembler. And if that sounds completely bonkers and off the wall, I simply refer you to the man himself, Donald Knut, um, who, this is the art of computer programming, or at least volume one of it. I have this, only the first three volumes. I don't have the fourth volume yet. Um, this is the 1997 edition, third or fourth edition, uh, I think, whichever. Um, they were originally written in the 60s. And, and he, so he started out just a prodigy um, of a uh, student in university, and he wanted to write a book on compilers. He, he spent his summer writing compilers and, and making quite good coin doing so. So he, he wanted to write a book on compiler design, and he realized that to get to the topics of compiler design, he wanted to, he'd have to write a whole bunch more. So he wrote 3,000 pages handwritten, 
and took it to the publisher, and thinking that it would be about 600 pages worth of material. And the publisher said, no, actually, given how small you write all it's going to be more like 2,000 pages. And so um, he went and broke it up into pieces, eventually released the first three volumes. What was really funny is when they reprinted volume two, um, they had to retypeset it. And the system they used to typeset the first time no longer was available. So he had to retypeset it, and he wanted to do it well. And he realized there was nothing other that would do what he wanted to do. And so he went away and said, I'll be right back. Uh, let's design a proper typesetting system. Uh, it took him eight years <laughs> before he came back for volume two. Um, and that was how tech, T-E-X, tech, the, the you know, things we know from LaTeX, um, that people still use to this day to format their scientific papers, their theses, and whatnot. Um, came from re doing volume two of this. Uh, volume four only came out in 2011. Volume five is still in 2020. Um, it was like 86 or something like that by then. Um, the volume five, or volume seven, I think it is, or seven, I think it is, is actually the one that's supposed to be about compilers, which I think is really funny. So, anyways, this is the Art of Computer Programming, Volume One, Fundamental Art Algorithms, Third Edition. Um, he starts by talking about maths and doesn't actually get into programming for a bit, but he uses a make-believe, a made-up um, computer language um, assembler called Mix, um, or Mixall, I should say, running on a computer called Mix, M-I-X, which is 1009 in Roman numerals. There's a really funny reason why it's called that. If you read the books, you'll find out. Uh, so he says why, he actually gives a, a rationale for why he did not use a high-level language, which at the time was Algol and Fortran, um, but a machine-oriented language. And these were his reasons. I'm just going to read it to you, excuse the boringness of reading. But A, a programmer is greatly influenced by the language in which programs are written. There's an overwhelming tendency to prefer constructions that are simplest in that language rather than those that are best for the machine. By understanding the machine-oriented language, the programmer will tend to use a much more efficient method. It is much closer to reality. B, the programs we require you know, in the books are, with a few exceptions, all rather short. So with a suitable computer, there's no trouble understanding the programs. Basically saying they're not going to do anything complex in here. And you don't, when you're teaching and learning right at the beginning, you don't go off and write a 10,000 line uh, program. Um, you write small things, easy things to do. So it's OK if you use something that's a little bit more difficult. Um, it doesn't have all the high-level sugar. And it sees high-level languages are inadequate for discussing important low-level details, such as co-routine linkage, random number generation, multi-precision arithmetic, and many problems involving efficient usage of memory. D, a person who is more than casually interested in computers should be well-schooled in machine language, since it is a fundamental part of a computer. E, some machine language would be necessary anyway as output of the software. Actually, that's not true today anymore. That's really a, um, something that's more true like pre-mid-90s, but definitely of the era. And F, new algebraic languages go in and out of fashion every five years or so, which is true. It's still happening while I'm trying to emphasize concepts that are timeless. So those are, I think, the important things. Number one, when you teach a language, um, even if you're teaching programming concepts and development concepts, if you're using a high-level language to do so, you're going to paint the mind of that new learner with the constructs of that language, what's easy in that language, what's hard in that language, and this will go into their head uh, as to what is, is the norm for developing software. Um, secondly, it, the higher-level languages don't teach you anything about what's actually happening in the computer. And if you want to seriously develop software, you need to understand maybe not what's happening at the hardware level, that's a plus, but what is it actually doing? When you create a hash map um, you know, or a dictionary in Python or Ruby, what does that actually mean? What's actually happening? What's the cost of that? Um, and third, it's timeless. If, you know, again, there, there, his options back in the day were Algol and Fortran. Um, and you know, if you were taught C sharp at school. What happens, you know, in five or ten years when that's no longer the big thing? So timeless concepts, and that's from Donald Knuth himself, not me. And I have to agree. So my first 
um, suggestion is yes, a low-level language. And you don't have to pick a real assembler um, because they tend to be fairly complex, at least to get into, because they have all the concepts of modern computing. So in these books, he uses um, one that he designed that's artificial and vastly simplified called Mix. Um, it's a bizarre one. It's definitely 1960s architecture. The byte is six bits long. The sign of the byte, or uh, sign of the word, the words are signed, not bytes, and that, an extra bit outside. And it has um, hardware devices like um, a card puncher device. It's defined in the specification. That's pretty cool. There's a more modern one that's used in, in Bond 4 called MMix. Um, and there's even a virtual frame buffer addition that you can get to it called MMix with an extra X on the end. Um, and that's gives you a virtual frame buffer you can even paint into, which is kind of neat. Um, and the MMix is much more modern. Um, it has a proper size byte, and it's modeled after a RISC processor, which is kind of funny since they semi gone out of, out of fashion now by now. But it's there. Um, and this really, I think, gives people a good idea of what's actually happening when you do, you know, create a, a dictionary that's a, based on hashed. Um, keys, what does that mean, how does that work, what is the real complexity of algorithms, um, what does it mean to call a function? And, you know, I first realized this was a problem probably 15 years ago when I, you know, had enough kind of experience of my own that I could, you know, sit there and people ask me questions who are coming out of school and, you know, over beers one night I realized that um, of the you know, four or five university students that were there were all writing code None of them understood what a pointer actually was, and one of you know they just started in their C course, and pointers had been explained to them, but it just the idea of well, what is what is an address in memory? I had I sat there and explained it to them, and which isn't hard to do, but it's so much harder to do when you don't start closer to the middle. Um, some may say that these concepts are not relevant anymore, to which I say, bye. They are completely relevant because it's still what. How computers work. Now, from there, um, I don't think you need to you know, do your course where you only learn work with an artificial uh, assembler. I think that as an introduction to what software development is, I think it's a great start. Uh, from there, where do you go? And to me, languages are easy to pick up once you know one of them um, in a given family. So if you know a C-like language, all the other C-like languages are easy, to, are easy to pick up. If you understand object-oriented design or object-oriented programming, any object-oriented language is easy to pick up to some degree or another. Um, you have to learn the libraries and the syntax details, but it's the concepts that are hard. Um, for serious developers, I think it'd be really cool, uh, and I, I miss this in you know for me, and I wish I had gone this path myself. I think that it'd be really great if they, the kind of next thing that people went into was a functional language. And there are still some really good functional languages out there. It's not just the realm of, of um, computer science geeks and, and lunatics. Um, Erlang is, I think, a pretty great language. It's being used in the real world for actual things. And in one of the early episodes of Luminosity, I talked about React. It's actually implemented in a functional language, well, in Erlang. I think this builds upon that, you know, assembly level development and gives people a good concept of, of what um, is, uh, what programming is really about. Um, from there, I think, you know, interesting concepts of trying to design and whatnot and programming is, is good and move on to higher level languages from there. I also think it might be useful to throw in some real-world frameworks that introduce the necessity of certain things. I talked about Node.js in previous luminosities. I think it's great because it enforces test-driven design. You pretty much have to um, if you want to do anything non-trivial. Uh, so it really is a great course, um, a practical course in how to do um, test-driven design. Uh, there's a huge community around it. The Everything is async nature, really introduces some interesting concepts. Uh, to the, the program's toolkit that are just absolutely essential today. So there's an ex half hour of what I think is a great first language um, in, um, yes. I, I look forward to seeing what people who watch this later um, have to say about, about all that.
And this is coming from the guy who writes in C++ um, QML and Node.js most of the day. This is not where I think people should start at all. <laughs> so, and yeah, I actually have a little section in my notes here about why not things like Ruby or C or Perl um, or some cutting edge thing. I think I cover that pretty well. Um, I could dog each one of those for reasons they're not suitable for entry level um, options. And I think that um, industry languages like Java and C Sharp are, are just far too oriented towards the practicality of developing in, an, in a monetized environment um, and not particularly useful for teaching people useful things about programming. And you can pick those up easily once you understand the basic concepts. Great. So, like I said, I look forward to the, the flames and, uh, and comments later. The second topic I wanted to take on today was uh, Zapian. So this is a pretty technical episode. For those of you who are waiting in this far, going, wow, this is like super technical. I have to do shows as well, or episodes where it's completely philosophical about computing and freedom. Um, other ones which are about desktop and other ones about system administration, server, it's variety. So it tends to be kind of technical, uh, especially on the, on the programming side. Um, yes, so we're moving on to Zapian. And what is Zapian? Well, it is um, a free software, full text indexing system. Now, it's not a database server. Um, there are products that sit on top of Zapier that provide this. But it is a, uh, a library that allows you to index and then uh, query bodies of text. So it's an information retrieval uh, system that works on large corpuses of text. Um, and it's used for some pretty seriously large sets of data out there. Uh, Gmain, if you're a free software person, you may have searched in Gmain one, one of the many, many, many mailing lists that they have there. Um, they have some fearsome number of tens of millions of emails um, that they have archived. And they use APN to index and then search them as well. That's a pretty big um, use case for it, apparently. Uh, but there's many others that use it in you know, tens of millions of documents um, in real world uh, environments. So that's a really cool and very big win, I think, for free software that you have something as robust as that. And it's not the only in, uh, option in this field. There's also the perhaps better known and definitely older Lucene um, and C Lucene if you don't like Java uh, or you don't want to work with Java um, that is out there. It doesn't compete with full solutions for search, such as Elasticsearch, which is <clears throat> cool in its own right, and based on Lucene underneath. Zapian, as, as with uh, Lucene, is designed to be in, put into or used in your application. So if your application has need to do full text searching, um, this is a, a system to do it. So it stores the, it's a, uh, uh, data in its own database files. It has its own database backends. Um, they have a new one that's on the way uh, as well called Brass. Right now there's one called Church that they use by default. Awesome names. I'm sure there's some story behind each of them. Uh, it has some pretty neat features in that it does support things like replication, master-slave only though, but you can query from any of them, of course. Um, you can use remote databases, so you can connect um, over SSH tunnel, or directly you can, you can have a server that comes with it that you can start on a certain port, um, and it will, it will talk from your local application remotely to the other side. And it looks like a, a local uh, database, which is pretty cool. So those two things in combination are pretty impressive, given that it isn't actually a server solution. Um, the documentation is really, really good, I find. Um, they've got uh, introductory um, uh, uh, texts as well as great API documentation. It's all there. It's written in C++, by the way. So, yeah, more for us C++ guys. Although they have bindings to PHP and Ruby and a host of other um, languages as well. So, generally um, useful. It is an object oriented design. It's a fairly light one, though. They don't go super heavy. I find the C Lucene, which is also written in C++, to be a bit more of the traditional um, heavy-handed C++ style of API design. Um, so that's a plus for it. 
the database files right now, they're smaller than they used to be, but they're still rather large. Um, it's not the fastest indexer out there. Um, we've seen is, uh, according to everything I've seen, and used um, faster at, at indexing just in terms of raw speed. But the results are quite fast, and they're very accurate. Um, so Zapien uses a probabilistic me, um, uh, means of querying things. Uh, so it looks at word frequency, where does a word appear inside of the full text. Um, it can do things like synonym searching. Uh, it can do, it ranks, of course, according to, you know, frequency and whatnot. It even has a built-in feature to do incremental searching. So as you're typing, if you're, you know, it's getting longer and longer, um, it will actually treat that as a growing, if you tell it to you, as a growing um, uh, query. So if you search for, um, well, the example I think I saw online was cat. Um, you might be looking for cats, because cats are awesome. We also might be looking for caterpillar or catalog. And so it will treat it like an ongoing growing query. Um, and not just give you searches for cat, but also maybe catalog. And if you search for, you know, say, clothing cat, it might not return so many cats. It would probably return more clothing catalogs if that was in your, your corpus data. So that's pretty cool. Um, and really what Zapien's strengths are. So internally, <clears throat> it has these databases. You have more than one of them, um, which means that you can either say, within your application, I'm going to be searching multiple different data sets, uh, or you can shard your database. So if you have a very large uh, group of errors, a data set, you can split it out into multiple files, um, sharding it out across disks or CPUs, um, and do your search that way. Um, so that's pretty neat. And in, in the database files, this basic structure is a document, which makes sense because it's for full text documents uh, originally. But you could call anything a document. A contact could be a document, for instance, a person. Um, so don't take it too literally. It's just an internal way of looking at what it stores. And then every document has a list of attributes. Um, there's no schema involved, uh, which is both a plus and a minus. So it's not great for storing you know, random data, I don't think. But for text, uh, textually um, biased data, I think it's really good. Um, and so it's a list of attributes. And these lists are you know, what words are in there. Um, but you can also assign things like random Boolean variables uh, to it. You can um, tags, you can add to it. Uh, although it, they don't appear as tags, they're just attributes or, or other terms you're adding to it. And then when you search, it will actually search all of these attributes that are listed as well as the full text um, index that it's built. So it, it's really quite flexible. You can add more than just the text. Um, you not only have the, the text processed, but actually add other data that your application is aware of that data. So um, KDE Semantic Search now uses Zapier for a lot of the storage in the back end, for example. And the, Nice thing about this is it gets you know we really want things like type as you or search as you type, so that feature I mentioned earlier uh, fits in really really nicely, quite beautifully actually. Um, when we when it gets say an email, it will pull up the contact and the, you know who is it sent to the BCC where is it from um, these other bits and pieces. Um, eventually, we'll do attachments. That's not implemented. There's a to do in the code still for that. Uh, but it can th then it tags the document, which is the email, all of those things. And similarly with contacts, it can do similar types of things. And so it's really nicely suited to these kinds of applications. Um, of course, the question is, well, would you not use a database for this? Um, or why would you use this instead of a, a full database, like you know, PostgreSQL or MySQL, which both come with built-in full-text indexing these days? Um, the answer is, I think, pretty simple. If your application is already using a database to store that data, such as Postgres or MySQL, use the database. If, however, your application is doing the search um, as its exclusive or sole or primary purpose in life, um, or you're using a key value store that isn't really suited to this kind of thing, then Zapien is really the, the way to go. 
Um, so when you're using Zapier to use, you put documents in with a list of attributes, and then to get them out, it has a really nice query builder. And it, the query language is, is um, not like SQL. It's easier for the average person, I think, to get wrap their head around, but it's full feature. It has and, or, x, or, not. Um, you can parenthesize things. Um, it supports wildcard m- matching, so you can put a star somewhere, and it will match you know, that fragment plus whatever. Uh, you can, and because it has different attributes, you can say, I want, you know, this attribute that matches, you know, whatever. Um, so you can say emails with, you know, that came from, you know, Aaron Psycho. Um, and it will come up with that. You can say email sent from someone or by someone whose, you know, name contains Psycho, which is actually what is now used in, in contract to do exactly that. Um, so it's really, really flexible, but you don't have to sit there and write complex queries. The query builder actually handles most of this for you. You can build queries incrementally, just so you can build documents incrementally. So both the storage and the retrieval side is pretty nice API-wise. Um, I have some cosmetic issues with the API, but generally it's quite uh, robust and, and, and useful. Um, it does have nice things like incremental updates of documents. I will say that if you uh, replace or add documents wholesale, it does a hell of a lot of disk I.O. to accomplish this. And that's because it, it keeps fairly large tables um, in its database that do re- almost like reverse matches or reverse indexes between words and the documents and keeps track of the frequency. And so you can actually ask for things like, how often does you know this word appear? Um, and so when you add document or a document, It'll actually do quite a bit more I/O than you would expect, um, but this is really the overhead and cost of a full text um, system that has all the features that Zapier provides. And so you tend to want to be fairly careful with how you update um, the database when you're using it, and to expect that when you're populating it, it's not going to be as fast as simply throwing it into you know a SQLite database or some other system that isn't really doing all the processing that Zapian is doing um, behind the scenes. Yeah, on the flip side, you get really, really fast searches, and these are for partial matches and they're probabilistic. So I think all of that is exceedingly useful and cool. So that pretty much brings us to the end of what I wanted to cover in tonight's, or this week's fairly technical um, luminosity. Um, and to make up for the, the kind of technical ramblings and ramblings of this week, I commit to and promise that next week's will be fluffy and um, about higher and more abstract things to do with um, uh, free software and the coolness that it is. Um, I would like to, because I, met, I realized I forgot to mention it, that pretty much all of the things that I recommended in the first language th- um, segment are free software as well. Um, they all run on free software platforms. In fact, most of them are developed primarily with or on free software platforms, which makes them extra cool. The one example actually is our Knuth's Mix um, and, and Mix. Uh, they are uh, licensed under a particular license just for it, and it doesn't actually meet the free software requirements. But it's a teaching tool, um, and I don't think that's the worst thing ever. That said, Things like LaTeX um, and Tech itself are free software, and they came from uh, the guy who was writing the book about these things, well, to lay out the books where he introduced them. So free software running the world yet again. Um, I'm not going to take uh, Q&A tonight. I think there's not a whole lot of Yammer in the IRC channel anyways. Um, so I will catch any questions that appear later next week. Cheers. Have a great night, have a great week, and I'll see you in episode 20.